Hey, John here for Planet Safe Lubricants and AIM Gun Lube. I'm in San Diego with uh, Gary Duckworth. Actually, we're in Gary's man cave. <laughs> we're talking gun safes and a great gun collection. What kind of uh, gun collection do you have? Uh, I have quite a few. I actually collect all Winchesters as uh, just collector guns. Most, most of them are collector guns, but I do shoot some, but mainly side-by-sides, shotguns. Side-by-sides? Uh, yeah, uh, vintage side-by-sides. Uh, British shotguns, uh, American-made shotguns, which are L.C. Smith's, Fox's. Uh, um, I actually just required a party, which we'll talk about here in a minute. I had a good experience with that, but uh, Model 21 Winchesters, I have several of those. So I probably have, I really don't know, but close to probably 200 different uh, guns. Uh, right. Half of those being probably side by sides. Well, I see you spend a lot of time in your man cave. Yeah, I you, do. You claim to be married. <laughs> I am, and my wife, bless her heart, she's, she's, I guess it's just like get out of my hair kind of thing. No, I have no problem with my wife. She, she's totally supportive. She doesn't care, but she's like, yeah, okay, right, yeah, yeah, no problem. But yeah, no. Well, it's I, great. So, to, it's great to have a passion. Yeah, and, and uh, I do. Mine yeah. is again. I use my guns. I use my guns for not only collecting because of the. The quality of the guns. I just like the, the the handmade aspect of guns more so than. I mean, they make really good guns now, but I mean, I just prefer the older, right. uh, handmade quality shotguns from so sort of the early 1900s until you know maybe before the war. World well, war like II. they say, they don't always make them like they used to, right? Well, they don't. They don't. Again, quality uh, machining now is, is is and again, it's quality machining, uh, whereas. Uh, now but before it was all right. handmade you know i mean each part you can't interchange with another gun it's right. especially made for that gun all hand fitted all handmade i mean they have machinery of course to do those with but the quality of the guns are just to me different yeah. right i'm kind of old school yep. guy anyway so. <laughs> you're an old school guy but you did uh decide to try some new technology i did uh yes i did i've used uh gun oils for you know hoppies and you know the typical gun oils for years uh wd-40 as a cleaning agent uh that kind of thing but uh, i just happened to have an experience with your product that uh that i thought would be worth sharing with you uh that uh again i as i said i collect guns but i also use them i am quite a hunter uh mm. That's my passion. That's the reason I have my job is to support my hunting and gun right. collecting habit. Well, you got a nice place. You got some uh, land up in uh, Montana. I do I have some property in Montana. That we were actually hunting on a neighbor's property uh, this last October eighth through the fifteenth, um, and we got into town as our annual pheasant hunt. We go up to do hunting on on our property or right. my neighbor's property every year, uh, me and my friend, and uh, we got up there and. The first day we were there was, you know, we expected cold temperatures, but uh, it actually turned cold uh, the second day we were there. It was a little bit uh, uh, kind of by surprise. It was in the you know, low 40s Monday when we were hunting, no issue, and I used the same gun on Monday. Uh, 40s maybe got up to 48 at the highest. Right. But then Tuesday, uh, Tuesday uh, morning we got up to go, uh, uh, go hunting from our hotel room. We, we rough it. So we stay in a hotel room. So anyway, we got up and had yeah, maybe eight. Maybe my wife would go hunting. Yeah, yet. you never know. And we had eight inches of snow. Uh, on uh, the overnight. Big, overnight. Overnight. Uh, just, that's just overnight. So no problem. So we're up there. Obviously, we have limited time. Um, so we were going to go hunting anyway. And, you know, pheasant hunting and, and that kind of weather is usually nice because uh, the birds will hold better for the dogs to point. Um, but eight inches of snow is a little bit much. We like cold weather, but not necessarily not, always snow. Right. Uh, so anyway, I took the same gun that I had taken on Monday, which is a James Purdy Best let's, Game let's Gun. Let's take a look at that. Yeah. And this gun is, is actually quite a collector gun for me. It's like uh, my pride and joy. Let's hold uh, that up for the I had not the camera. Uh, shot this gun or hunted with this gun. I've shot it, of course. But uh, this gun is made in 1929. They're very expensive handmade guns, and you can still buy these guns today. This gun exact model would cost you in the neighborhood of $125,000 to $140,000, depending on what upgrades you want on the gun. This and gun, you actually use it as opposed to just I, leaving it on the wall. <laughs> I do, and most people think I'm crazy, but that's what this thing was made for. It's called right. a best game gun, and a game gun meaning for game. So right. I use my guns, but I'm very careful with them, of course. Hunting in snow, to me, was... If it was raining, I wouldn't have hunted with it, but right. it was snow, no big deal. Got out that morning, uh, we walked a corn row. We had a, a cornfield that was cut, one on either side of it. We had a probably, oh, 20 yards of corn that was not cut. And uh, 
it was thought it was a great idea when not guy get on the other side and the dogs were working the corn row birds came out and the day before that monday i had limited got my three roosters with my purdy no problem uh i don't know if i missed a bird i don't recall missing a bird that day that i had an opportunity to hit the second day uh snowing it was uh, 33 degrees high that day okay um it was drifting snow not real bad but it was cold and uh you're hunting in you know those conditions it's not the most opportune time to use a gun of any kind unless you shoot an auto loader or something like that and i don't right. anyway uh we had birds coming out both sides i first bird i pulled on i had gloves on they were tight gloves shooting gloves but i couldn't feel my safety the fall, first day i used the same gun and i didn't see any issue with it at all uh, I have not disassembled the gun, but the gun again was made in 1929. I don't know all the, the history, what, but anyway, you have oil on a gun. Uh, and this oil, evidently, that was used prior to me ever receiving the gun, like any other gun oil, it, I think the temperature range, and I had the same problem in Canada on a, my buddy did actually, not me, on another gun he'd used. It was an autoloader, and it froze up on him as he was, it wouldn't cycle. It'd shoot the first shot, but it wouldn't cycle. Right. Uh, and to me, I told him the oil had congealed. It had tightened up on him because of the cold weather. Uh, he didn't take my word for it. But anyway, later on, he figured out that's what it was. In this particular case, I was trying to uh, hit a rooster, a pheasant, a wild birds. They're not planted birds. They're wild. You don't know what's going to happen. Bird came out. I, and I went to click on my safety. And I couldn't hear the audible click. And you can feel it. You can feel the click. And your gun is on safety, of course, as you're walking and hunting. And I went to pull it off. It's timing. It's a matter of you're up, pulling the safety is off. When it hits your shoulder, you shoot. And it's that quick. It's a very quick reaction. So you, you, don't don't, have, you don't pull the safety out 20 minutes early. No, hell no. No, and it's very dangerous, and you don't want to do that. So it's always a timing aspect of, of shooting. I like anybody could tell you that's a shooter. There's timing that goes in with your process of shooting. You right. just don't just you know, have arbitrarily come up with different ways of shooting. You have a timing aspect of it. I went to pull on my gun to take the safety off as I was raising it. You carry the gun in a safe position. I went to pull the safety off and I couldn't quite feel if the safety was off or not. And I was, you know, my timing was off. So I said, yeah, I really don't know as you're going through the process, you don't know if the gun is really off safety or not. Right. And I missed the rooster. I got duck on it, and I wasn't really paying attention. I thought it was just me trying to get in the second right. bird, another bird, just uh, maybe three minutes later. Same thing on my side. Really sh good, nice shot, easy shot, or not easy, but a shot that I should have made. Same problem. And my buddy says, Gary, what the heck is wrong with you? Because, you know, we just don't, mm -hmm. I mean, you don't hit every rooster, but, you know, those opportunities you have to take advantage of. And they were decent shots, and I did that three times. Mm -hmm. And I says, Vince, I got a problem with my gun. He goes, with the Purdy? And of course, anybody in the gun world knows a James Purdy. They're, you know, one of the best made, if not the right. best made shotgun in the world. Not just, you know, in the United States, in the world. I mean, there's always going to be a debate on who, what the best manufacturer of shotguns are. And to me, this is probably the best, if not one of the best. Right. So... I got back. I said, you know, we, there's a problem. I miss it. I got a, finally got a rooster. Okay, fine. And we were both done for the day. Went back to the hotel room, and I had taken some of your oil with me on yeah. my trip. Uh, your AIM. AIM okay. CLP. You, you brought the I got new, the new stuff. This is the yeah. new weapons-grade CLP. Right. I got that stuff. And I, I got back to the hotel room, and I said, Vince, I got a problem with my gun. Because he was saying, why are you missing those roosters? He missed a couple, too, but it uh, wasn't, wasn't the gun. It, it was, But me, it was, I said, Vince, there's something wrong with my safety. And we couldn't believe that this gun had a problem with anything functioning on it. Anyway, and I'm saying, look at that. And it was like you couldn't hear or feel the click in the safety. Right. I got back, took some of your aim. I squirted it in the proper areas. I don't want to get it too much into the wood, but uh, which I did. I, I squirted around the safety, and it two clicks and thing was clicking just like this. Well, that's one of the nice things about this, right? That little needle tip. Yeah, and the next day, yes, and it was it was very easy to put it in the correct area because again, I, I you don't want to get too much oil in a around the wood. If you do, you want to wipe it off. But in this case, you can see the gold lettered safe. Right. You know, you can obviously t see where to put this put, put the oil, and I did. A little bit, I squirted a little bit of oil in the correct spots, moved it two clicks, two times, and it started clicking. 
just like it is now, operating correctly. Uh, the next day, we uh, didn't have snow, but it was still about 36 degrees that day. And uh, I shot three roosters, didn't miss a shot. Had no problem with my timing. So I like to blame my misses on my gun. <laughs> <laughs> it was the gun. <laughs> it was the gun. It's the Indian, not the arrow in my case. But no, the gun did have a, a functioning issue. Uh, it's simply because of the old oil that was built up in there, which is very fine, but it right. was still it kept my safety from operating correctly, which again, the functioning parts of the gun, uh, you know, there's frictions off that you involved right. anywhere you have friction and you're going to have an issue with, with the operation of that part if it freezes up on you. Well, yeah. one of the other, another local place, uh, the gun range up in Balboa, mm -hmm. um, they love aim. They keep aim on the firing line because mm -hmm. they do get customers in there who haven't maintained their weapons properly mm -hmm. and they jam mm -hmm. or they're not working mm -hmm. or not functioning properly mm -hmm. on the firing line. Mm -hmm. So they keep a couple bottles of aim and they just run out there and a couple drops and yeah. they're well, firing In this again. case, I think a lot of guys think that they're maintaining their weapons well. They, they think that and it's not always about how much more. More is not always good uh, for a number of reasons on especially a gun like this. You have, I mean, this gun is, you can't put a hair in between the metal to wood fit anywhere on this gun. You can't see a buildup of oil around it, and that's very important to me, or as a collector of a gun like this. Right. Um, so it, it's not always more is better, but in this case, this gun had been maintained very well from the gentleman I got it from uh, over the years, so it's it's almost flawless gun. Right. But in this case, what he had used maintaining it well, I think he had used actually a grease of some sort I'd found on other parts of the gun. Uh, I'm not sure what he used on the safety, but in this case, thought he was maintaining it very well, but the product he was using was not the correct product in right. that kind of, and in that kind of weather. That weather. And I've, right. I've, in fact, I even talked to you about hunting in Canada before. You're hunting right. in, you're laying on snow goose hunting. And, you know, you have parts in there that, that have oil on them. And if they freeze, you're screwed. Right. You know, it's just, you know, you're not going to be able to take it apart, disassemble it in the field. But if you have some of that aim right. with you squirt it in there baby and you're dead and our, yeah. our uh, you can use our aim in alaska the great white north north <laughs> of the arctic circle uh -huh. and antarctica yeah it this stuff loves mm -hmm. extreme temperatures and i found that's a very good cleaning agent also i mean it, it protects i would protect my gun with that stuff on the outside as well as the functioning parts of it well we do claim it's a clp it's, it's, we think it's the closest thing to a true clp on mm -hmm. the market mm -hmm because most people carry, mm -hmm. they're using all these different types of oils. Mm -hmm. And then when they start trying to use, and using AIM on different jobs, like for example, mm -hmm. your gun loader, or yeah. your shotgun shell yeah. loader, yeah. <laughs> actually, right back there. Right, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, it has a lot of moving parts in it and you're cranking that thing down every time and you're loading hundreds of rounds of shotgun shells. Every time you pull it down, one spits out. Right. But there's a lot of moving parts in there, those, those pistons. The actual. Uh, let's take a look at moving it. Moving parts of this. Let's, uh, hang, on, let's, chair. hang on. Let's get close. Uh, I actually have used aim on the the the, the rods. They, there's a you know the smooth transition of that is really important because you're out here pulling down on this thing and pretty soon you're going to wear yourself out. But you can see that the I, I used aim on this and any other moving part, including up here on any. Friction, any part that create has friction on it, uh, I've used your aim, and I tell you what, it was like a big difference between the the uh, the the tension that was on there, less the tension when I put your aim on it. It was just much smoother to pull down, easier to function. It operated and made my arm a little less tired at the end of the day. So it's, it's I use it on everything. I mean anything that needs oil, I use it on my locks the the that uh, lock my garage door. They slide back and forth, and they're outside, and it doesn't take long for any oil that you've put on there before, if you have put any on there before, to, to go away. To, to The weather just, you know, it dissipates. The aim, you put it on there, and it stays. I've used it on my screen door, the sliding of the screen door in the track. It's, you know, use it for everything. Anything that you need oil for that needs to have less friction or noticeable friction, use that stuff.